Here he was repelled again by dense, waterless mulga forests. Stuart abandoned his attempt to reach the Victoria River and took a more northeasterly course. And in late May, he broke through to Daly Waters. Now he came under fierce attack, with the Aborigines burning the bush all around him. Open fire! Stuart had always enforced strict organisation and iron discipline on his men. Every man had written orders to obey the leader. Nobody was to fire on the natives without orders, unless in self-defence. Cease fire! Mr Keckwick? All clear, Mr Stewart. They've gone. All right, men. Move out! Every man must keep his guns handy. And if the night watch ever fell asleep, Stuart personally promised to shoot him. Stuart particularly impressed on his men the need to care for the horses, because they were the key to everyone's survival. But the horses were already weak, and even Stuart was starting to fade. I feel this heavy work much more than I did the journey of last year. So much of it is beginning to tell on me. I feel my capability of endurance beginning to give way. They were nearly there. Stuart found a creek which led him north to the Roper River at the end of June, 1862. It is a splendid river. We have passed many brooks and deep reaches of water, some miles in length, and the country could not be better. It is really magnificent. The water of this river is most excellent. The soil is also of the first description, and the grass, although dry, most abundant from two to five feet high. This is certainly the finest country I have seen in Australia. After crossing a rough and stony tableland, Stuart came to a beautiful river running northwards through a deep gorge. He named it the Mary, and he followed it through swamp country to Chambers Bay, 80 kilometres east of Port Darwin. At last, on the 25th of July, 1862, Stuart was able to dip his feet and wash his hands and face in the Timor Sea. He was overwhelmed by his success. I have, through the instrumentality of divine providence, been led to accomplish the great object of the expedition and take the whole party safely through one of the finest countries men could wish to behold. If this country is settled, it will be one of the finest colonies under the crown, suitable for the growth of any and everything. Stuart's joy was short-lived. On the 3,000 kilometre journey back to Adelaide, the horses became so weak that every item of surplus equipment had to be thrown out, even the men's boots. No rain had fallen, and the land was dangerously dry. Unable to ride, Stuart was carried along on a stretcher, slung between two horses. By the time they reached the McDonnell Ranges, Stuart was in agony from advanced scurvy. His limbs had turned black, Whoa, and his gums were so sore and swollen that he couldn't chew any food. Stuart believed that he was in the grip of death. My body is reduced to that of a living skeleton, and my strength is that of infantine weakness, a sad wreck of former days. But there is no danger of the party not being able to find their way back should I be taken away. They did find their way back, all of them, and they recovered their health. 
On the 21st of January, 1863, Stuart and his gallant band of men, dressed in their ragged bush clothes and trailed by 40 bony pack horses, rode in triumph along King William Street, Adelaide. John McDowell Stuart was the hero of the hour. With indomitable courage, he had persisted till he found a practical track across the continent, and he had returned safe with all his men. On the very same day that cheering crowds welcomed Stuart back to Adelaide, one third of Melbourne's population watched in silence the state funeral of Burke and Wills. Their bones had been brought back by Alfred Howard from Cooper's Creek. There were those who wondered why Howard and others who went out like him with fairly modest parties in search of Burke and Wills, explorers like McKinley, Landsborough and Walker, could traverse vast areas of unknown country, make valuable discoveries on their own account, and yet return safely. While the Burke and Wills expedition had cost a fortune, turned out a disaster, and was commemorated in massive statues. Why had it all gone so terribly wrong? A royal commission into the tragedy put most of the blame on the inertia of Wright, the man who failed to bring up the supplies from Menindi, and on the exploration committee in Melbourne. Burke, they said, showed more zeal than prudence. Little was said about the original public attitudes to the transcontinental crossing as not a matter of life and death, but a Melbourne Cup with the local money on the unfortunate O'Hara Burke. In the end, Stuart's monuments were not great epitaphs in stone or bronze, but massive changes to the map of Australia. No explorer did more for his colony. South Australia gained the Northern Territory because of Stuart. Eventually, the railway and the Stuart Highway followed his tracks across Australia. But his most significant achievement was blazing a trail for the Overland Telegraph Line, which was built between Adelaide and Darwin in 1871. That established a series of cable stations and bases for explorers to attack the last great blank on the map, the country west of centre, from the Telegraph Line to the Indian Ocean. The challenge of this country produced the last great epics of Australian exploration. <laughs> 